Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for uh, who you are and that you have chosen to clearly reveal yourself in your word and throughout nature that all men are without excuse for the unbelief that they exercise. We thank you that you have chosen to not just reveal yourself to us through nature, but your people here this morning supernaturally, personally, and intimately uh, through the revelation of your Son, Jesus Christ, and specifically in his word. We thank you for the desire that we have to want to read this and conform our lives to it. We know that um, many unbelievers can arrive at the right meaning of Scripture, and yet because they hate you, they will not receive it or live according to it. We thank you for turning our hearts, which were bent completely towards evil, towards you. And we ask that throughout this series, that we would not simply store up knowledge so that we might uh, be judged for not using that knowledge later, but we would be um, not like the man who looked in the mirror walking away and didn't remember who he was, but we would apply what we learn and in so doing, bring you more glory in the way that we live in this world in which you've placed us. I pray now for clarity of speech and thought and, as Paul says, self-control and gentleness in teaching that you might be honored. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay, we've got uh, about 55 minutes. And what I'm going to do this morning is first go through a few, well, several, preliminary statements and disclaimers. Uh, this will be a series, Lord willing, as I was just telling Tim. Not sure how many sessions we'll have, um, but um, we'll have more than one. And uh, it won't go for half a year, I can promise you that, or even a third of a year. Um, but it will be several sessions. Uh, apologetics is a large subject. Before I go any further, though, how many of you have heard of the term apologetics before I just mentioned it? Great. Okay, so a lot of you. When did you do that? A long time ago, I guess. Okay, so long ago, you can't even remember. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, how many of you know the meaning or will be confident that you know the meaning of the term apologetics? Okay, that's good several of you. And how many of you have taken a course uh, or read a book on this subject? Okay, a few of you. And how many of you have taken a course in philosophy at the collegiate level at least? Okay, a few of you, good. And the reason for some of these questions you'll realize later if you don't already. And how many of you have read any books or articles by Cornelius Van Til or Greg Bonson? So about half dozen of you, good. And how many of you think my wife is beautiful? Okay, everybody should raise their hand. Okay. No, she didn't. She didn't see these notes beforehand. Yes, Larry. Uh, no, there's not. <laughs> Only unless it's in Scripture. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> whether it's edible. Okay. Well, Christians, uh, that's my first preliminary statement in the form of questions. Uh, Christians ought to give credit where credit is due, and much of what I'll be presenting to you this morning uh, comes from the pen or the lips of Greg Bonson or Cornelius Van Til, primarily distilled through Dr. Bonson, who was a, a godly, brilliant man of the scriptures uh, foremost and philosophy uh, secondarily. And uh, um, seldom will a person at this point in human history have an original thought, and so I don't want to make myself out to be the person who's going to be teaching you things for the first time. Uh, there's some books and resources that I'll be offering later um, that will hopefully hone your skills further in this subject. And speaking of sources of learning, much of what I'll be presenting in this series may be found in this book, Always Ready. Has anyone read this, all of it? Great, sort of. Um, well, I encourage you to read this, I commend it to you, and uh, I want to 
give some praise to the leadership of the church for having already purchased this book as well as Richard Pratt's book, Every Thought Captive, and they've made it available in the back. And so um, there won't be a, a book assigned for this series. I know that makes a lot of you happy because you're already feeling perhaps overwhelmed by the home group book, and then along with your daily Bible reading, uh, it can be somewhat taxing to have to read a whole lot. Um, so it's not required for the course, and um, this series of lectures will not exhaust the subject at hand. Uh, again, it's a very large subject. It can be taught from different perspectives. The goal of this series is to simply introduce you to the biblical approach to apologetics, uh, piquing your interest to pursue the subject further as a church and on your own. Apologetics, like many theological subjects, is large and has far-reaching implications. Even so, I'll only be emphasizing what I consider to be the most important aspects of the subject during the series, and I hope that most, if not all of you, will desire to know the subject more deeply uh, as we move along and after it's complete. And then, Lord willing, I've talked with Larry and Keith down the road, um, we'll have a session two or a, a, a part two to this series, and maybe a part three and four. Uh, over the next several weeks, um, Sunday school is going to be, in many ways, like baseball camp. Um, Dr. Bonson, if you've listened to any of his lectures, he's used this analogy in teaching, uh, not just apologetics, but teaching in general. Uh, how many of you have ever attended a baseball camp? Oh, you have, Marcy. Okay. All right, so just a couple of you. Well, good trainers in trying to teach people how to hit a baseball or how to play the game um, do not teach them everything, every detail about the game. Uh, for example, if you're wondering to know how to hit a certain type of throw, um, you're going to be taught the general dynamics of the motion of a baseball and a baseball bat you're not going to hopefully have a trainer that's going to try to teach you to hit every single try, uh, type of pitch. You know why? Because there's an infinite number of pitches, types of pitches. You'd be in that baseball camp the rest of your life and you'd never actually play the game. So it's impossible um, to teach you the specifics of every scenario that you're going to run into in baseball or in apologetics. And so good trainers will teach you the general dynamics of the game, league rules, proper technique, how to throw, how to bat, how to catch, how to steal bases, how to work with other team members. It's analogous to what we do in the church, right? And a professional baseball player should be able to hit anything thrown to him, even if he has never seen a particular type of pitch. Okay, so he may not have studied a particular pitch, but if he's learned the game well, he'll still be able to hit it return the ball. And that's what we're going to be trying to do in this course over the next several weeks is give you the general approach to how do we defend the faith. I think there is a way to defend the faith and there are ways to not defend the faith. For example, we could shoot people. That would probably convince people, at least until they bled to death, that our faith was true. But the Bible, of course, doesn't condone that sort of behavior, does it? Now, that seem, may seem obvious to you, but there are certain ways to defend the faith that are simply not expressions of faithfulness. Okay, and as you may know, the Apostle Paul likened Christians to soldiers several times in the New Testament. And you don't need to turn there this morning, but in 2 Timothy 2, I want to read just a brief passage, five verses from that chapter. And Paul said this to the young man, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So three times you've already seen a metaphor for a Christian. What is that? Soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. So an apologist who shoots his opponent would not be comp competing according to the rules. The assembled church, therefore, I think can be viewed as an army of sorts. 
Why do armies, uh, or what do armies do before they engage the enemy? Anybody? Tim. What do I, what, what's one thing an army does before they engage the enemy? That's right, they train. They learn how to engage the enemy. And then they train, and then they train some more. I mean, we spend billions of dollars every year in this country to train soldiers. Train and train and train. And uh, I want you to take advantage of this hour that we're going to have together every Sunday morning and view it as a training ground. Now, is training always comfortable? Does training always make you happy? No. Now, it's not my intention to irritate any of you at this hour of a Sunday morning. But I can assure you that if I do my job well, unless you're perfectly sanctified, which you're not, at times you're going to be irritated. I was when I first learned apologetics because I still had sin in my life. And the way in which I was seeking to defend the Lord was not completely in conformity to his scriptures. I want you to ask questions during this time. Uh, just raise your hand and ask them. And... Uh, I'm going to ask you questions. And if you're not comfortable with me asking you questions, if it really uh, bothers you, then after this class, come to me and say, Tony, I am not comfortable being asked questions in public on the spot, and I won't do it. And it, again, it's not my intention to, uh, in it, to simply irritate you, but I want to challenge you. And sometimes you have to do that with asking questions to individuals by name. Um, now, for a variety of reasons, the study of apologetics, and I know this from experience, uh, having taught it for at least four months at a school in this area at one point, it tends to elicit questions that don't always have to do with the subject. I remember when I was teaching at this school, after a short while I was asked, do you think Roman Catholics are going to spend eternity in hell? Now, that's a, a valid question, but its relevance to at least where I was at in the course was low, if at all. Um, and so if you do have questions uh, for the sake of everyone else and for the sake of the time that we have together, please try to keep them on topic. Yeah. Um, okay, so just as loving drill instructors pose questions to their uh, cadets, I'm going to ask you a few questions from time to time. And if you answer qu incorrectly, that's okay. Um, I'm not going to shoot you. No one's going to torture you or make fun of you. If they do, we'll talk to them after the class is over. Um, but if you do answer incorrectly, as someone who loves you, I'm going to respectfully tell you if you're incorrect. It pains me when I watch teachers who pander students when they answer incorrectly. Really, it leaves the student confused oftentimes as to whether or not their answer they gave was correct at all. So if you're going to make mistakes, just like soldiers on a training field, better to make them in this time rather than when you're out on the battlefield, okay? And uh, related to questions you ask of me, I permit and welcome, not just permit, but welcome your challenges to what I say. If you have thought through what I've said and if you can challenge it respectfully, um, that is to say, without making me cry. No, just kidding. Um, so please, um, if you disagree with something, raise your hand and advance the challenge. Yes, Kim. Will training sessions be available on Facebook and YouTube with refreshments? I think so. I think right now it's being recorded. That's why I've had to watch my language so far. Just kidding. And if you're, again, shy, well, this is a different point. If you're shy or not quite sure how to verbalize a question, write it down and give it to me on a piece of paper, or you can tell me after class and I can address it the next time. That'll also give me some time to reflect on it before answering the question. Yes? Now, the greatest difficulty, uh, thank you, in teaching a group like this is the variety of the attendees. You're all at different levels in your education, in your sanctification, uh, your experience, your background, your interests. 
Some of you may be at this point thinking, I'm going to stay home for the next several Sunday mornings. Um, I've tried to structure the series and the content of each lesson to stretch all of you while still being accessible. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Uh, and related to this point, it's rightly been said that theology is the queen of the sciences. That's right. And as such, some of my speech over the next several days or Sundays will probably be a bit at times abstract and difficult, um, but it's not impossible to grasp. I don't think I'm the smartest man on the planet, and if I can grasp it, I think with time spent and reflecting on it, you can grasp it too. The race is not always won to the swift, but to those who persevere. That was a statement I often thought about during my engineering days when I thought, I'm going to get a tumor if I study vibrations anymore. It's a hard subject if you've never taken that. Um, and if I repeat myself, it's not usually because I immediately forgot what I just said, um, but it's a pedagogical device to simply reinforce what I think is, re uh, is important. And at times, I'll purposely speak slowly as if you're listening to a tape that's been slowed down in order to ensure that what I say is what I wanted to say and to enable you to process carefully each word that I say. And sometimes we'll actually be looking at it on paper. There will be handouts in the class. And does everyone have a handout for today? OK, good. Uh, another preliminary statement is the series on apologetics will not do you a lot of good if you don't attend all of it. If you're not able to attend all of it, then please do pick up or listen to um, the audio file. As with all subjects, knowledge is a building process. You think about language, if you've ever studied any language or really any subject, um, if, you don't, if you don't understand the, um, the fundamentals of it, if you don't get all the blocks, then the building's not going to look very good. It's not going to perform very well. If you only have half the parts to a car, it doesn't run very well. And take notes. I hope you will bring pencil and paper and take notes during the class. Uh, write questions to yourself. Unless you're very much unlike the vast majority of smart people in the world, you'll probably remember very little of what I say every morning. You know, if I, that's why I think good preachers focus on one point. Because usually, as good as a series may be, you're only going to remember a little bit of it, even if you're brilliant. And so please take good notes and, and bring that handout, especially this first handout, bring it every time. And the reason for that I'll explain later. Uh, homework, we're going to have some homework. From time to time, I'll ask you to read an article, uh, memorize something, including scripture, or answer a question or two in preparation for the following week. And I'll shoot to keep the time required for you uh, to spend on this course uh, to about five minutes a day which isn't asking a lot. So 30 minutes maybe of reading an article or try to memorize something each week. I already do have one homework assignment for you. In God's good providence, just last night before I went to bed, uh, I slept about 12 hours the night before. <laughs> yeah, Tim knows because he called and I didn't answer the phone at 10.30. Um, but I, uh, I was late last night watching a YouTube clip uh, by one of my favorite apologists, Dr. James White, uh, whom some of you know. Uh, he's an apologist out of Phoenix, Arizona. And if you would, write down this web address for his blog. And then the entry is this one here, Thoughts on the Day After an Historic Election. And for those of you who, for whatever reason, are averse to so-called political stuff, it's, this is not about politics per se. But what he had to say, it's about 18 minutes long, pertains so well to this series. And God's good providence, again, it was just that I happened to watch that last night with Angie, and what he had to say was excellent. And by the end of the series, you'll hopefully think about that YouTube clip and say, he was right. What he had to say was something we needed to hear. And if I do my job well over the next several weeks, another preliminary statement, you will love Jesus more at the end of um, this series. And God hopefully will be more pleased by you and your faithfulness to him. 
I'm not talking about your positional righteousness. I'm talking about your practice as a Christian. In 2005, uh, one of my former pastors, he asked me during that summer while I was at graduate school to consider preaching a revival at his church in Marlow, Oklahoma. And in um, January of 06, before about 25 members of that church, I said the apologetic seminar that I'm here to deliver is not titled a revival, but it should lead to one. But it should lead to one. Apologetics is not an academic parlor game for Christians who happen to find it intellectually stimulating. Oftentimes it reduces to that, sadly, but rather it is one of many ways by which a believer may walk in the good works which God has pre prepared before him for him to walk in, Ephesians 2.10. And as such, faithfulness to the charge of doing apologetics will vivify or revive the church if the flock is faithful to do it. Now, sadly, a lot of times, I just know from experience, people hear things like this, and it has no effect at all in their life. Of course, that happens, I guess, with every time you preach, and it's very discouraging. Um, the studying this subject uh, can lead then to the revival in the church, but it can also lead to the church being judged. <clears throat> After a restatement of some of Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 5 through 7, uh, we read in Luke 12, um, 33. And if you want to open to Luke 12, please do that. Luke 12, 33, I'm going to read just a portion. Of um, a passage that I pray will weigh heavy on our hearts as we begin this series. Luke 12. Vernon, you had a question. No, I'm just, um, just wondering if this is going to be focusing on this transcendental argument um, primarily. Um, or I know you said launch it eventually, so I'm just wondering what you're Yeah, we'll eventually uh, discuss. Vernon was asking about what's called the transcendental argument, um, and we will talk about that at some point. It's a very technical term, but by the end of the series, you'll know what that means and know how to apply it. In Luke 12, 33, Jesus says, Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money, belts, which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Verse 38, whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, Blessed or happy are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, My master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces, and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave, who knew his master's will, and did not get ready to or act in accord with his will, received many lashes. But the one who does or excuse me, the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but a few, from everyone who has been given much much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. 
So after this series, all of you will know more, I think, of your master's will. And if we obey in this area of evangelism and apologetics, God will probably revive us, I hope. But if not, I think he's going to judge us. According to this passage, whatever it may mean, I think it does indicate that there is a judgment that will come to that slave who knew his master's will and didn't do it. And of all times in human history, and I don't know all of human history, but it sure seems like this is a time in which we had better get serious about the task of defending the faith in the public square. <clears throat> all, f- <clears throat> excuse me, all fields, uh, my last preliminary statement, all fields of study will entail a peculiar vocabulary, and apologetics is no different. And while I'll make a conscious effort to avoid overly technical terms, I will at the same time purposely use a lot of technical terms to save time and to precise certain expressions to make them more accurate. Um, If you don't know the meaning of a word that I use, uh, please raise your hand and ask me to define it or jot the word down and look it up later. And there will be terms beyond those which we're going to look at hopefully sometime this morning that I may use with which you're not familiar and please just raise your hand and ask. Um, There's no need to be embarrassed by that. Okay, any, any questions or thoughts on the preliminary statements and comments, disclaimers? Okay. All right, well, at this point, I want to talk about our series roadmap that is subject to change, where we'll be going in this series. And uh, we've already talked about uh, remarks and disclaimers. We're first going to look at the terms that are associated with the theory and the practice of apologetics. They're two different things. There's a theory of apologetics, what some people sometimes call meta-apologetics, and there's the practice of apologetics. And then after that, I'm going to quite briefly give a synopsis of what apologetics is and is not. And then we'll look at reasons we do not evangelize or apologize. Hopefully by now you've discovered that apologize isn't meant in the way that we use it today. We're not telling people we're sorry for being Christians. Uh, And then we'll look at the biblical basis or precedent for the practice of apologetics, who is to be an apologist, and all these stepping stones in the series will be hopefully titles at the top of a handout that I give you, so you don't need to remember all these. So the biblical basis or precedent for the practice of apologetics, there are some Christians who don't believe that we should engage in apologetics at all. Anybody ever run into any of these people? Well, that's good. Uh, The next step will be epistemology, a term which we'll look at here in a while. Uh, Which epistemology or theory of knowledge should the Christian utilize in his defense of the faith or in his way of justifying knowledge claims? Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians who really undermine the Christian faith as they seek to defend the faith, and I think that's due in large part to a faulty what we call epistemology. And again, we'll talk about that term in a moment. Yes? Yeah, that's true. Oftentimes, sadly, those same types of individuals are the ones that don't even go to church. It's a very personal, it's overly personalized faith. Yes? I was just thinking, um, the Scopes um, trial, monkey trial, that you were sharing, I thought about that, I saw the movie, and afterwards, so many Christians felt that there was no real way to defend their faith. That's right. In fact, uh, hmm. oh yes, I already said that. When we talk about reasons to that people don't evangelize and apologize, that is the number one reason given. Fear. It's also the number one reason people don't like to speak in public. They're 
they're very fearful for a variety of reasons. But you shouldn't be afraid. Because he who is with us is much more powerful than he who is in the world. And God, I believe, has given us a means of shutting the mouth of the unbeliever. Uh, next, we're going to look at briefly, this could be a whole subject in itself, but it's called Natural Theology and the Classic Proofs for God's Existence. And at that point in the series, I'll be handing out a paper that I've written on the subject um, for you to read. And then we're going to look at the theory of defending the Christian faith, a checklist for arguing with unbelievers, something that you can hang in your brain, so to speak, so that when you're about to engage an unbeliever, you can just quickly think about these points in your mind to give you some uh, a structure to how you present your arguments. And during that point, we'll look at two steps to comparing opposing worldviews. We'll have an exposition of Acts 17, 16 through 34, which is no doubt the exemplar par excellence of Christian apologetics. Um, we will then apply the theory of apologetics in the consideration of Islam. A lot of Christians think Islam is one of the greatest challenges to Christianity, and I think politically it certainly is. And I don't mean politically as in who we elect. I mean geopolitically. <clears throat> All of you in here, I'll say right at this point, should be studying the Quran at some point and becoming familiar with the worldview that is challenging ours all over the world. It doesn't mean you need to become an expert in the Quran, but it does mean you need to have some familiarity with what your coworker oftentimes believes. Yes? It's online. I mean, after you and I talked last Sunday, I went and started reading it online. Great. That's awesome. What's interesting is, <clears throat> I guess the original English translated Jesus as Isis. Isa, yeah, Isa. Mm -hmm. Isa. Yeah. But then the modernized version I found had Jesus, because I did a search on Jesus, and they don't even talk about Jesus. Well, further reading revealed that, you know, they did. They do. Yeah, good point. It is available online, so you don't need to go buy the Yusuf Ali translation that I have that costs like 50 bucks. Of course, some Muslim friends gave it to me, um, but it's available on the web, and you can do searches. Um, we'll also, in applying what we learn be, um, Lord willing, listening to a debate between Gordon Stein and Greg Bonson, what in my opinion is one of the best presentations and applications of uh, the apologetic method that I'll be teaching you. And then if we have time, maybe also watch a debate between a current living, very vocal, rabid, you might say, atheist Christopher Hitchens and um, Douglas Wilson, which just happened at Westminster Seminary. Or maybe a debate between a um, Christian apologist like Dr. White and Shabir Ali, a noted Islamic apologist. And um, as in the case of teaching and preaching, the acquisition of apologetic skills is largely caught, not taught. Okay, everybody catch that? So as in preaching and teaching, a lot of times good preachers and teachers become good preachers and teachers, not because they'd read a book on teaching and preaching, but because they observed an excellent teacher or preacher or listened to hundreds of hours of someone teach a particular subject, and they become adept at teaching that subject because they've had a great role model. And such is the case with apologetics, I think, that if we witness good debates, there are a lot of sorry ones out there, but if you witness good debates, you will be affected just in the way that you present yourself the arguments you use, the attitude you have in approaching the unbeliever. And so hopefully, I, I hope you will avail yourself of these debates that we have. Um, yeah, I'll skip that. Oh, one more comment about debates. Lest you think, well, that's really getting academic and we should just be focusing more on loving Jesus. Um, let me just share a personal testimony with you. In 2004, sometime when I was started going to school, I was listening to a certain series by Dr. Bonson, my teacher, and I remember in the car almost coming to tears. I mean, I did come to tears, just not where the point where they flowed down my face. Um, in listening to a, um, a debate between him and I think at this point, actually, the debater didn't show up, Michael Martin, to engage Dr. Bonson. But there was an audience member who asked Dr. Bonson a question. And the question was, do you ever doubt that God exists? 
And Dr. Bonson said, no, I have no doubt whatsoever that God exists, but at times I do doubt that he loves me. If any of you know about Dr. Bonson's life, it was difficult, very difficult. Um, so he said at, doubt, at times he doubted if God loves him. And um, I think he would admit Dr. Bonson was sinful in his doubting that God loved him. He shouldn't have doubted that any more than he doubted or sh didn't doubt that God existed. But nonetheless, um, I was very moved by that uh, for different reasons. And contrary to even just recently a, um, a seminarian acquaintance's opinion, debates are an excellent medium for learning, for maturing you, for seeing how real Christians behave, how they answer in a public forum like that. Uh, I think it's a medium for mat maturation in your life and increasing your love for Jesus. Um, that is amazing that God loves me. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, um, and then last, after we do some apologetics applied, I'll have a summary of biblical apologetics. Okay, so I know that's a lot of information. And um, beyond an occasional side comment, I have one more comment, uh, as needed, I will not be covering the history of Christian apologetics um, Instead, I'm going to refer you to an article that will be in the resource list that I give you at some point entitled Socrates or Christ, the Reformation of Christian Apologetics. Has anyone read that? Okay. Uh, it's in a book uh, edited by Gary North, Vernon. Uh, and um, lastly, I want to just, for those of you here that are more visually oriented, what we're going to do in this series is uh, if we're here today, and um, this is our goal down here, um, what we're going to do starting, um, well, after we cover the definitions that we're going to start here in a moment, I'm going to take you to the end of the subject and read, as I said earlier, a synopsis of biblical Christian apologetics. And then we're going to come back to the beginning and we're going to take a little circuitous route back to that same point. So you'll know where we're going, kind of like looking at the Mona Lisa. And then we're going to come back and see, well, how was that painted? You know, learn how to paint like that. So there should be lots of reinforcement in the, in the course. Okay, everybody got a handout? We're going to use it now. And in the remaining 15, 18 minutes, we're going to go through some basic definitions, or I'm going to give you some basic definitions of terms associated with the theory and practice of apologetics. Uh, the definitions of most words will be given later again, and expanded, and there'll be other words that follow. Vernon mentioned one, transcendental argument. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that this morning. Please take notes uh, and reflect on these terms, for they'll be very important as we move forward. If six weeks from now you're still not sure what rationalist means, or empirical, or the term apologetics, um, the value of the course will not be nearly as much as it should have been. So please think about these and bring them to class each time. And it's not my intention that you master these. Don't, try to, don't go home and try to memorize all these before next Sunday. Um, okay. Apologetics? Yes, Vernon. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you'll send me an email reminding me, I'll shoot it to you. Okay. I put these in alphabetical order, and it just so happens the first word is apologetics. That worked out well. Apologetics is a formal defense or justification for believing something. It doesn't have to be Christian apologetics. A formal defense or justification for believing something. As I just said a moment ago, there are Muslim apologists. There are apologet apologists for atheists. Every time someone speaks, actually, they are behaving as an apologist. When you watch the news, the talking head is an apologist for some worldview. Another definition, which comes from Van Til's Apologetic, a large book written by Dr. Bonson, is the vindication of the Christian worldview as a whole. Now here we're talking specifically about Christian apologetics, the vindication of the Christian worldview as a whole. And then lastly, 
from a condensed paraphrase of Dr. Van Til, the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the non-Christian philosophies of life. And I've left a little bit of space after each definition if you want to write down any of the notes, any, uh, anything that I say afterwards, please use that space for that. An argument. Next word is an argument. At least it should be on your handout. An argument is the presentation of premises, that's plural, premises or reasons in support of an inference or conclusion and the offering of evidence to substantiate claims. To argue is to produce considerations designed to support a conclusion. I wish Natalie was here because a few weeks ago when we were out witnessing, she said she had a friend who, I think it was, was asking her about apologetics, and the friend didn't want to engage in apologetics because you had to argue to do it. And we're told in the Bible not to argue. Right? <clears throat> That's not how we're using argue in this class in this series. So if by argue you mean be contentious or cantankerous or mean, no, you're not to argue. But if by presenting premises or reasons in support of an inference or conclusion, etc., uh, then yes, you are to argue. Paul did. Okay, uh, autonomy. I'll just keep moving on unless you want me to slow down. Autonomy, you've heard that word mentioned many times in this church already since I've been here, a law unto oneself, a law unto oneself. It's built from two Greek words, autos and namos. Autos, just a pronoun. Namos, a law. So it just means self-law, self-law. The word embodies intellectual self-sufficiency to determine possibility and impossibility. In fact, just recently, about a week ago, I was having dinner with a pagan with whom I work, and this man at one point just admitted that it was impossible for something I was saying to be true. It's just, it's just impossible. I didn't say it then, but I wanted to say, you ever heard of the word autonomy? Uh, but he was exercising a lot of autonomy at that point. It also embodies um, self-sufficiency in the area of ethics, what's right and wrong, um, you can, off, you can think of it as mental. People who want to be mentally neutral, they say, I'm mentally neutral on maybe everything. Well, that's very naive, but they're also, it's, it's an expression of being autonomous. Okay, the next one is begging the question. And there are certainly more terms that we could cover in this course, but I've found in my experience in having studied this off and on for 10 years that these terms often come up. And if you'll master these terms, I guarantee you, you'll be a better apologist. And that's not because you'll be able to bowl over your opponent with, in, with vocabulary or terminological sophistication. Oftentimes, knowing the meanings of these words will help you in your thinking, how you're reasoning with someone. Begging the question is the fallacy of assuming what is at issue or up for debate in an argument in order to prove the argument. And I've found that a lot of times definitions don't stick unless you give it an example. So I'll give an example in just a moment. Uh, reasoning, another definition is reasoning wherein one's premise or premises includes the claim that one's conclusion is true. Okay? All of us have probably committed this fallacy, and all of us have seen it committed. Many times we've not noticed it because it's very subtle. Oftentimes it's very hard to detect. But if you get good at being an apologist, one of the reasons we're going to study fallacies in here, because many times when you're conversing with an unbeliever, or maybe a believer that's not thinking correctly, people commit fallacies all the time, and if you don't catch them, you're going to get bogged down in them. And instead of being able to move on in a discussion by saying, well, you just committed a certain fallacy, and what you just said has no relevance, or doesn't really pertain to what's being said, uh, then you'll just get all caught up in that and probably misled if you don't catch the fallacy. Anybody need me to repeat the definition of that one, begging the question? Okay, here's an example. The character of matter 
is unchanging. Therefore, nature is predictable, which allows natural scientists to know certain things. That may seem really abstract. I'll explain. The character of matter is unchanging. Therefore, nature is predictable, which allows natural scientists to know certain things. This fallacy was committed by Dr. Gordon Stein in the 80s in his debate with Dr. Bonson. Any, did I ask, did anyone listen, has anyone listened to that debate? Okay, good, great. Yes? Which allows what? Therefore, nature is predictable, which allows scientists to know certain things. Yeah. The statement is a fallacy or is fallacious because the desired conclusion of Dr. Stein that nature is predictable was assumed in the premise. Let me first before I move any further. Um, usually in, uh, when people argue, they're going to set up what we call it's right there on the front. Everybody got the homework? Usually when people argue, they're going to advance reasons for a conclusion. And in my definition here, or argument, that reason is a premise, we call it. Not sure exactly where that comes from, but. So we'll have premise one, premise two, maybe 45 premises, maybe just one. And that all these premises will hopefully advance or serve to support some conclusion. And we do this all the time. Um, the famous syllogism, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Okay, um, let's see, Jesus loves me, Jesus saved me, uh, or maybe it's a better one, Jesus is all powerful, Jesus saved me, Jesus will always keep me, because he's all powerful. Something like that, y'all get the point. So you have reasons for believing something that we call premises. <clears throat> when someone says matter simply has an unchanging character, as he said here, they're begging the question because the uniformity of the matter is the very thing in question. See, unbelieving scientists will admittedly say that we don't know that matter is always going to behave the same way, and philosophers have pointed out that, well, if nature is not uniform, then you can't then claim to know that tomorrow when you put baking soda and vinegar together, it's going to produce carbon dioxide gas and make the cork pop off the beaker because you've not observed the future. Um, and Stein probably unconsciously was committing this fallacy, just bought into it a long time ago, and he said, well, hey, you know, I know I can know certain things because the character of matter is unchanging, therefore nature is predictable. Well, the character of the matter that it is unchanging is the thing that needs to be demonstrated. And he's assuming it. And if you didn't get all that, it's okay. Um, but from now on, when you watch the news, when you read books and stuff, you're going to see this. And many times, like in this case, you wouldn't catch it. But when he says the character of matter is unchanging and nature is predictable, that's just the restatement of the same thing. Like, here's a real blunt one. Um, Angie loves me because Angie loves me. That's a real tight circular reasoning. Okay, why does Angie love me? Well, because Angie loves me. So my, in that case, my premise and my conclusion are the same thing. Same words. So you really have to be you know, low on energy to not catch that one, but like I said, sometimes you won't catch them. But Bonson did. And whenever it's pointed out to your opponent or to an audience in this case, it has a lot of effect. Yes, Kim. Um, the fallacy of assuming what is at issue or up for debate in an argument in order to prove the argument. And then I can't remember what else. Did I have reason? Yeah, includes. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't re finish reading my paragraph. Circular reasoning is similar to the fallacy of begging the question. 
And we'll cover one more term. I knew we wouldn't finish. And it's okay in this series. It's like baloney. We can just cut it off wherever we want. <laughs> epistemology, big word, often sounds like a foul cuss word, epistemology. The third major division of philosophy in which theories of knowledge are considered and evaluated. Who's heard that term before? Raise your hand. Okay, a good number of you. The term is the combination of two Greek words, episteme and logos, meaning uh, logos word or discourse, and episteme, knowledge. In the Bible, um, there's a different word for belief and a different word than um, knowledge. Epistemologists consider and attempt to explain the origin, nature, methods, and limits of knowing. How do, you how do you know what you claim to know? That's the often made question to illustrate epistemology. What do epistemologists ask? How do you know what you claim to know? Uh, what justification do you have for claiming that you know a certain proposition? Proposition is a claim. So here's a claim. Yahweh is the one true and living God. Another claim. The Bible is God's word. How do I know the Bible's God's word? Really, that's the, that's the fundamental question that I'm seeking to answer biblically in this course, in this series. Pardon? Because it says so in the Bible. That is a reason that we believe that it's God's word. Mm -hmm. And lest we digress with three minutes left into trying to answer that question, uh, and I think the answer to the question will fall out. But there are many ways in which we answer that question as Christians, not perhaps you, but I've seen Christians say, well, the Bible's God's word, I know, because it makes me happy. It brings me joy and peace, it gives me meaning in life, whatever else. Yes? So for me, one of the classics is a song that I don't think we ever, I choose it. You ask me why I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Yes. Not necessarily classic, but. And we have some biblical warrant for believing that as a reason that the Bible is God's word, Romans 8, 16, for his spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. So there's an internal example or reason for believing that the Bible is God's word, but, you know, Mormons can say the exact same thing, and Larry knows that. No, and I'm not, I, I don't right. think it provides uh, accurate uh, declaration. I mean, there are reasons, mm -hmm. but. Just two weeks ago, we had some Mormons come over, and that was ultimately their foundation for why I should believe the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price are all inspired. Because you'll have, they didn't use the term, they didn't use the Book of Mormon term, burning in the bosom. But uh, nonetheless, that was their foundation. If you just read this and pray, you'll have a burning in the bosom that will affirm that what you're reading is from Yahweh. Um, how does a person come to know something? Okay, epistemologists ask, how do I know this watch is here? Now, some of you may think, well, that's stupid. You know, that, that's a big waste of my time. Let's get on with life. Well, it's not. And sadly, a lot of Christians poo-poo that sort of thinking, and they shouldn't, because we have biblical answers to that. We have a biblical epistemology. Now, most Christians are not epistemologically self-conscious, Vernon. We talked about that term before. And uh, so sometimes they'll claim we don't have one, uh, but oftentimes they just, you know, we, we've not thought through a lot of the things that we take for granted in our lives. And I'm thankful for a lot of pagan epistemologists like David Hume, who comes along and kicks some Christians in the pants to get them to think about, how do I know what watches here? How do I know tomorrow that we're going to have seed time and harvest? The sun's going to rise. And the Angie will be who she is tomorrow. She could wake up and actually be the identity of Tim in a chance universe, right? Anything's possible. Um, now, a couple other questions they ask is, can two persons know the same thing? You know, if, if Vernon knows that Kim works at a certain hospital, can I know that too? 
And if I say yes, how? Uh, is knowledge of anything possible? Yeah. Is there such a thing as a universal? Can I know that universal? Even if there is one? Is that what? No, time is continuing and universal? Matter is unchanging. Yes, Stein was wanting to be a consistent atheist, and um, he really betrayed himself throughout the debate, um, because if you're an atheist, you believe that worlds matter in motion, you don't know that tomorrow that matter is going to behave the same way. Now, as Christians, just to um, say something I was going to say later, we do know that tomorrow matter is going to, we knew electrons are all going to repel tomorrow, even though I've not observed all electrons. Neither of you, neither is anyone else. Um, and during this series, I want to allow time for comments, you know, questions like this. Um, and at times, though, if I think that it would get too abstract, and I know I'm going to cover it later, I'm going to say, you know, let's just sideline that for now. Otherwise, it's not going to profit a lot of you, the majority. And whatever makes the majority happy is truth. That's a joke for those listening by tape. Yes, Marcy. Good. Because a lot of what we're going to be doing in this course is we're going to learn how to be better philosophers. All of you are philosophers. All of you are theologians and all of you are apologists and all of you are evangelists. It's just a lot of Christians aren't good philosophers. And that's sinful, according to Colossians 2. Because we do have a philosophy after Christ. So we're going to try to sanctify ourselves as we look at the scriptures to teach us how to be better philosophers in the defense of the faith. Yes, one last question. Yes, uh, an error in reasoning. All right, well, thank